Electricity can be a daunting concept for a new 7 Days to Die player. If you want to know how to set up your electrical components, then this video is for you. I'll be going over how to generate power, how to wire components together, and what components are available as well as how to use them, along with some advanced tips for setting up your electricity. If you learn anything new in today's video, be sure to leave a like, but with that out of the way, let's get into my 7 Days to Die electricity guide. Let's start with generating electricity. There are three ways to generate electricity in 7 Days to Die. The generator bank, the solar bank, and the battery bank. Let's go over all three of these and how to use them. The generator bank is probably the first of these that will be available to you. It's crafted at a workbench and requires the advanced engineering perk at rank 3. Alternatively, you can find the basics of electricity schematic. Once you have either of those, you'll need 10 forged iron, 10 mechanical parts, and 14 electrical parts to craft it. Once you have one, you can place it like any other block, and then you can press E to interact with it. Here you'll find 6 slots for small engines, a turn on button, a refueling button, and the statistics relevant to the generator. Each small engine put into one of these slots will increase the maximum power output of the generator by 50 watts, up to a maximum of 300 watts. You can see your max power and current power usage in that statistics view. Each electrical component you wire to this generator will increase its power usage, making it use more gasoline. To fuel the generator, you'll need gasoline in your inventory, and then you'll want to press refuel until it hits its maximum fuel capacity of 1000. The generator will only generate power and use gasoline when you press the on button. When the generator runs out of gasoline, naturally it will stop providing power, which would be very unfortunate if it was the only thing powering your defences on Horde Night. Which is where our second power option comes in, the battery bank. The battery bank is craftable at a workbench with its schematic or the fourth rank of the advanced engineering perk. It requires 10 forged iron, 11 electrical parts, and 6 scrap polymers. Once again, the battery bank has 6 slots, but instead of small engines, it requires lead car batteries. Lead car batteries come in different quality levels, with a level 1 battery providing a maximum output of 29 watts all the way up to a level 6 battery, which is the highest level, which will generate a maximum power output of 50 watts, which is on par with the small engine you would use in a generator bank. This does give the battery bank the same maximum power output as the generator with 300 watts. When the battery bank is turned on, it will provide power to connected components using its batteries. When producing power, the durability of the batteries will deplete, seen on either the health bar or the selling price of the battery. To recharge the batteries, you can connect a another power source like a generator to the battery bank, recharging the batteries using power from that new power source. Do note that the bank must be set to on for the batteries to charge. It's also worth noting that if you connect a battery bank to a component, then either connect a generator or solar bank to the battery bank, the generator or the solar bank will power the component attached to the battery effectively making the battery bank nothing but a relay, as the generator bank or the solar bank will now be the primary power source for that component. For example, you can see that the battery bank has no power draw even when connected to a turret. The battery bank has no power load because the generator takes on the power load, turning the battery bank into a relay. The battery will work as a relay even when you switch it off. With that in mind, it would be a smart idea to interrupt the connection between the power source and the battery using a switch. Interrupting this connection allows you to choose when to charge the batteries. You would then also want another interruption between the battery bank and its child components to isolate the batteries and charge them without straining the power source. As I said earlier, the power source will use the battery as a relay and power the child components even when the battery bank is switched off, so manual disconnection with a switch is required. The final source of power is the solar bank. The solar bank can only be purchased from traders secret stashes, with the better barter perk at at least rank 5. The solar bank has 6 slots once again, this time requiring solar cells. Solar cells are also purchased from the traders in their secret stashes at ranks 4 and 5 of better barter. Solar cells also have quality like batteries, a level 1 cell will give 17 max power and a level 6 cell will give 30 max power, allowing a maximum power 
power output for a solar bank of 180 watts. Solar banks will only produce power when turned on and between the hours of 4am and 10pm. Since solar banks require sunlight, they are best used to charge battery banks during the day or as emergency power. As I said already, batteries will transfer power load to the previous power source, which could be problematic, as the solar bank only has 180 maximum power, and the battery has 300. Once again, isolating the battery with switches will allow you to manually charge the batteries when needed without straining that power source or limiting the battery's power output. My recommendation after seeing all of this is pretty simple. In my opinion, you should use generators. Forget the battery banks and the solar banks. Battery banks are annoying to use and rely on either solar banks or generator banks to work in the long term anyway. And solar cells are expensive and locked behind a high level of intellect and better barter. However, the generator is cheap to make, easy to unlock and simple to fuel because gasoline is extremely easy to acquire in large amounts. And you'll need some if you're using vehicles anyway, which you should be. Engines are much easier to find than batteries or solar cell because there are more sources of them in the world. The engine also doesn't have a level to account for, simply giving 50 power. The only real drawback of the generators is that need for gasoline, however you should be swimming in gasoline by the time you want to start doing electricity. The only time I would use either battery banks or solar banks would be on a map with no desert biome. If you're unaware, oil shale only spawns in the desert and is turned into gasoline. On a map with no desert, you will eventually run out of cars to scrap meaning gas will become a precious commodity, at which point solar panels and battery banks would be worth the hassle. And that's all there is for powering, which is probably the most complicated part of electricity in 7 Days to Die. It will be very simple from here on out. Let's cover the next important part of electricity, wiring. To start wiring, you're going to need a wire tool. Wire tools can be crafted at the workbench for 9 forged steel and 3 mechanical parts, or you can loot them from hardware stores and tool crates. I wouldn't recommend crafting them because you should really be swimming in these by the time you start electricity as well. To connect two components, you want to select your wire tool in your hotbar of course. Right click on the power source or the component connected to the power source and then right click the block you want to power. The direction you do this is important because power in 7 days to die is one way. If you equip the wire tool, you should see yellow dots running across the wire. The direction they are going is the direction the power is going. If you accidentally right click click the wrong power source, you can left click on the block to cancel the wire before connecting it to something else. If you accidentally powered the wrong block, you can left click on the block to remove the powering wire from it. There are also a few helpful tips to keep in mind while wiring. Number one, a component can only accept one wire going into it. This means that you can't have multiple power sources or components sending power to one thing. Number two, a component can send out nine wires directly. Complex electrical systems need relays to act as hubs for components. I'll explain more about this later. Number 3, a wire can only reach 10 meters. However, you can extend a wire an additional 5 meters by right clicking the power source, walking 10 meters and then clicking over the further 5 meters, effectively giving you 15 meter long wires. Number 4, wires can go through walls. As long as they are within distance, you can connect two objects straight through solid steel, assuming you can find a route to walk between the two components. And number 5, Holding a wire tool will reveal more information about the electricity around you. As I said earlier, you can see the direction currents are travelling by the yellow dots. You can also see the cone of vision of turrets and motion sensors, and you can see special currents like tripwires and electric fences. I'll be covering more of those later in the video, so be sure to stick around. That's all there really is to know about wiring, let's move on to the fun part, components. Components can be perfectly divided into four groups. Traps, triggers, lights and other stuff. Perfectly divided. Before we get onto that I should give you a couple of tips about components in general. First of all, all components are craftable on the workbench so if you don't have one, get one. Secondly, in the radius of a land claim block you can pick up all components including the power sources. You want to place the land claim block down, press E or hold E on the component and press take and after a small amount of time it will be put back into your inventory. This also works for workstations like forge workbenches, chemistry stations and cement mixers, by the way. With that out of the way, let's start on the first category. 
traps. First of all, traps can be made cheaper with the advanced engineering perk. Second of all, electrical traps will not give XP for kills unless you have the advanced engineering perk which will give you 50% XP for trap kills at rank 5. What this means is you'll get half as much XP for a kill with a trap than you would have if you had killed the zombie yourself. And finally, the advanced engineering perk will allow you to craft these traps without needing the schematics for them. What I'm saying here is if you're going to be doing electrical traps you'll have a much easier time if you invest in all 5 levels of the advanced engineering perk. You don't have to, but it does help. So what electrical horrors can you inflict on these poor meat boys? Let's start simple with the blade trap. The blade trap requires 20 power to function. According to the game files, the blade trap does 20 damage per hit, which after testing is true. The game files also say that the trap uses 4 points of durability out of its 2000 health every time it hits something, which again after testing is true. When your blade trap is at half health, it will change its sound file to indicate the need for repairs, and at 25 percent health, the blade trap will stop entirely. This means that it won't attack itself to death, mathematically allowing the blade trap to hit something 375 times, dealing 7500 damage before it goes into its broken state. With that in mind, the maximum repair cost of a blade trap is 10 forged steel. The easiest way to use these blade traps is to build an elevated catwalk and place robotic sledge turrets on it, and have the blade traps in a pit below. The sledges will knock zombies off the catwalk and into the trap pit below. Remember that blade traps can set off demolition zombies, so they often need to be replaced in the late game. It would also be wise to place relays out of the sight of cops and have them connect to the blade traps individually, rather than having the blade traps carry power to each other, because if one is lost, all the connected traps will lose power. Using relays will prevent this. Let's move on to the second trap, the dart trap. The dart trap requires 10 power, and when powered and supplied with iron darts, it will fire them continuously until it runs out of ammo or the power is disconnected. Iron darts are craftable at a forge for 3 scrap iron and 1 clay. For the darts to fire, you need to lock the ammo in the interaction screen. Unlike the blade trap, the dart trap does not consume durability when it fires. Each iron dart does 45 damage and the trap has a maximum ammo capacity of 1500 darts. This allows it to potentially deal a massive 67,500 damage before it runs out of ammo. A common way to use these traps is to use them in corridor bases, placing trip wires or pressure plates along the ground and connecting them to the dart trap. When a zombie runs over the plate, the trap will fire. To allow the base to still function as a corridor base, it's a good idea to place arrow slits along the pathway. This stops zombies from reaching the traps but allows darts to pass through. Two dart traps firing at each other will not damage each other nor will they damage the arrow slits. That's all for dart traps, let's go to electric fence posts. To make electric fence posts work, you need two of them. One will be the power source and one will be the end point. If you wire the source to the endpoint, the wire between them will electrify. Every time something passes through the electrified wire, they will have a 100% chance of receiving the shock debuff, which completely halts movement and deals 3 damage per second for a short time. Each time the shock effect is applied, which can happen multiple times consecutively to the same target, the end post will take 0.5 damage. These posts have 200 health, meaning a wire will inflict the shock effect 400 times before the end post breaks. Once again, only the post receiving this current will take damage from this process. Do note that the post can still take damage from cop spit, gunfire and explosives. A good strategy for electric fences is very similar to the dart traps, but instead of using plates, use a master switch in the corridor. When horde night begins, electrify the wires. Remember to leave both ends of the post accessible from inside the base, but still protected outside. As an added bonus, you can drop the electric fences down one block. This will make the fences hit the zombies legs, and it will also apply the shot to smaller enemies like crawlers and zombie dogs. Another popular strategy is to have a single electric fence post going through a corridor, with the powering end being in a protected box outside the base and the receiving end being on the inside of the base somewhere the player can very easily fix it. There are strengths and advantages to both strategies, as the layered fence posts are much safer to use because you don't have to worry about your entire electric fence relay being broken by one mistake, however it is far more material 
materially efficient to use the single wire. Really, it's up to you and what kind of base design you have in mind. Also, remember if you are using the first strategy to use relay hubs rather than wiring the source posts together because we don't want them to rely on each other to power their end post. For the same reasons I mentioned earlier in the blade trap section. The final two traps are the turrets. Robotic sledges and robotic turrets are not a part of the electricity mechanic and I won't be covering them today. What we're showing today is the SMG turrets and the shotgun turrets. The shotgun turret unlocks at advanced engineering rank 4 or with its own schematic. Each shotgun turret requires 15 power. Neither of these turrets will damage the player that owns them by the way. The turrets can be interacted with and set to target yourself, allies, strangers and zombies. The shotgun turret requires shotgun shells to fire. It can't use armour piercing shells or breaching rounds. Once again you'll have to lock the ammo or it won't be able to fire. With its 3 ammo slots it can hold up to 450 shotgun shells at a time. When powered it will attempt to shoot any of its designated targets in its cone of vision within 15 metres. The damage a shotgun turret can do is hard to calculate because it doesn't use the damage value of the shotgun shells. As a result of the turret using pellets, spread and having a lot of damage fall off it's not really worth trying to calculate the damage it does. The shotgun turret has a firing pattern. It will fire a burst of 4 shots followed by a 2 second cooldown. It's also worth noting that turrets do benefit from triple headshot damage. You can manually fire the turrets by going into the interaction screen and clicking on the camera while it is powered. Much like regular guns, turrets will generate heat when firing and will attract screamer scouts, so having these active at all times will likely lead to more problems than they'll solve. I'd really recommend saving them for horde night. One good use for shotgun turrets is to place them on the roof of your horde base so they will target vultures that may be trying to break in over your head on horde night. The other kind of turret is the SMG turret. The SMG turret is available at advanced engineering rank 5 or again with its own schematic. Just like the shotgun turret, the SMG uses 15 power. The SMG only uses 9mm ammo and will not accept armour piercing or hollow point variants. It can hold up to 900 rounds with each shot doing 32 damage at optimal range. The SMG turret will try to engage any of its designated targets in its cone of vision within 30 metres. The SMG also has a firing pattern, this time being 15 shots followed by a 2 second cooldown. These are best used as anti-vulture defence or as extra firepower for horde knights. Remember that they do sometimes hit demo buttons and repairs will need to follow. And that's all five of the traps. As I said, robotic weapons are not a part of the electricity mechanic, and I've covered them in another video which I'll link in the description. I'm also just jumping here in the middle of the video to remind you that if you're enjoying it, be sure to hit that like button, and of course, if you like content like this and are learning anything new, consider subscribing. Anyway, let's just get back into the video with triggers. Before we get into it though, I should say a few things about triggers. First of all, trigger costs are completely unaffected by the advanced engineering perk. And second of all, unless I specify otherwise, assume that all of these are using Advanced Engineering 3 or the basic sensor schematic to unlock. The first trigger available is the switch. The switch consumes 1 watt of power when turned on or off, powered switches pass current to the connected components when switched on, and when powered and switched off, the connected components will turn off. Pretty simple. It's a switch. The next trigger we have is trip wires. These are slightly more complicated, working similarly to electric fence posts, requiring two to work. You'll need a source and an end. If something crosses the wire while the source post is powered, the end post will output a current. The settings of this are configurable by pressing E on the trip wire. You can choose a delay on powering and a duration of powering. Trip wires are configurable to be active while something is colliding with the wire, or set to be activated for up to 60 minutes or even set to a permanent toggle. Each post requires a 1 watt of power. Motion sensors require advanced engineering rank 3 or their own schematic. These work similarly to turrets with targeting settings as well as the same trigger and delay settings as the trip wire posts. If a designated target walks into the cone of vision of the motion sensor, it will output a current. These can be very useful for automatic lights and doors and I'll explain a little bit more about these later in the video. The next trigger we have is the trigger plates. We have the 1x1 trigger plate and the 1x5 trigger plate. These work identically and for this demonstration I'll just be using the simple 1x1 plate. The pressure plate is functionally similar to a switch, but rather than a manual toggle, the power passes when an entity steps onto the plate. It has the same delay and duration settings as the tripwire posts. Not much to say here. It's a pressure plate. 
Zombies, players, animals and vehicles activate it when they go onto it. That's all there is for triggers, let's move on to the next category, lights. First up we have the basic light bulb along with the industrial light and the industrial light bulb. The basic and industrial light bulbs require 5 power each and the industrial light requires 7. These are all unlocked by advanced engineering rank 3 or the basics of electricity schematic. The spotlight is also unlocked with advanced engineering 3 or the basics of electricity schematic. The spotlight takes 5 power and can be aimed by holding E and clicking into the camera while it has power, allowing you to direct the beam as you need it. All lights can be toggled on and off by pressing E on them or by using a trigger like a switch. Believe it or not, that's all the powered lights that are actually available to the player, so let's move on to the other stuff. The first category we'll cover here is the powered doors and drawbridges, specifically the powered vault hatch, the powered vault door, the two powered steel garage doors, and the powered reinforced drawbridge. These are all unlocked with advanced engineering 4 or with the powered doors and drawbridges schematic. These doors and the drawbridge will open when the power is connected and close when it's disconnected. I've set all of these pressure plates to 5 second durations to show how to make a simple one way automatic door. Simply connect the trigger to the door. Door. However, creating an OR gate to make a two-way automatic door is surprisingly simple as well. You want to connect your trigger to a power source. I'll be using a pressure plate as my trigger in this instance. You then want to connect that first trigger to the second trigger on the other side of the door. And then you want to connect the second trigger to the door, allowing you to power the door from either side. You can configure delays and durations as needed for your exact door system. You can also use trip wires and motion sensors for this. Motion sensors are the best option in my opinion. They are configurable to be activated for designated targets, perfect for vehicles and garage doors. Just remember, if you're going to use the motion sensor for a vehicle door, you want to add about 3 seconds of duration to the sensor so the back of your vehicle is not hit by the door. You may also want to adjust the viewing angle of the motion sensor for your specific needs. Next up we have the speaker. The speakers make an annoying sound when powered which can attract nearby zombies, and that's all they can do. A much more interesting block is the wire relay. Unlocked at advanced engineering 3 or with the basics of electricity schematic, using 1 watt of electricity they allow you to extend wires or manage your wire placement. These are the key to wire management. If your wires are messy, use relays. If you need more connections, use relays. If you need power to be further away, use relays. If you're doing any kind of complex electrical system you'll need a lot of these. Electric timer relays are a similar block unlocked with their own unique schematic. They allow power to pass through between the times set in the interaction screen and they also need 1 watt of power. These are good for timed defences or lights or really annoying alarm clocks and that should be just about everything you need to know about electricity in 7 days to die. Did I miss something? Did you learn anything new? Either way let me know down in the comments and while you're down there why not check out 25 beginner tips and tricks for for 7 days to die or whatever YouTube recommends. Be sure to subscribe if you want to see more videos like this and of course thank you to my channel members Violet Plague, Elodie, The Many Talented Mr. Jefferson, Eviserina, Grassy Gaming, VR Studs, Cool Anime Girls and Devin Hebert. Thank you all so much for watching and I'll see you in the next video.